Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar as part of the series that we've been running. One of the, uh, the great uh, worlds of joining in this COVID is that we've come up with these new and exciting ways of doing things. So uh, thank you for joining us. I also have Phil uh, Hamenko with us today, who's our compliance manager. He's up in Queensland and doesn't understand the concept of lockdown. He's read about it, but uh, he's enjoyed golf the whole way through. Uh, so today we're just going to run through uh, some things and we'll do it in our, in our format that we've been starting to do it, a bit of a question and answer format. And Phil's going to test my knowledge. So I'll hand over to Phil to, uh, to start the day off. Thanks, Ashley. Looking very dapper in your waistcoat again today, mate. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Hides my belly. All right, we've got a lot to get through today, Ashley. So let's just kick off with relief from insolvent trading claims. There's been a lot of talk in the press and a lot of articles about the deadline of the 31st of December. What can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so Phil, this was one of the initiatives that, uh, that started back in, uh, in March, where the government provided a uh, protection from directors in the, through insolvent trading as they went through uh, as we went through the pandemic phases and the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. uh, about three or four weeks ago, they extended that uh, through, well, it was probably a bit more than three or four weeks ago now, but they extended that through to the 31st of December. And it really is like a safe harbour protection that allows directors to, to trade their business without fear of the personal liability. Mm -hmm. um, it is at this stage only being extended till the 31st of December and with some of the other stuff that we'll talk about a bit later with the new protections, it would appear as if the government's not going to extend that any further. Um, but it, it, the reality of insolvent trading is it's only one issue that uh, directors need to be aware of as they run through these things. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to Safe Harbour, but it's not really Safe Harbour, is it, Ashley? No, the, the safe harbour, the actual safe harbour provisions require a lot more uh, documentation and paperwork to be run through. This is just a blanket protection uh, that's in place. So we've got a deadline of the 31st of December and directors may face risk of an insolvent trading claim. What about if they're not in a position to liquidate that company by the 31st of December? Is there anything they should be thinking about now or preparing for? Well, Look, absolutely. The, the problem that uh, the unintended consequence of the legislation um, does appear as if uh, that if you don't have the company in liquidation by the 31st of December, they will lose that protection. That wasn't actually the, I don't believe that was the intention of the policy. The, the policy was designed to give people that, that protection through that window. So if they don't believe that they're ready for liquidation, then they may need to look at uh, formally putting safe harbour provisions in place. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's a whole myriad of concerns in itself, but they certainly need to get uh, specific advice around that. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you, if they do need to put a company into liquidation, there are ways and means to, to ensure that that's done correctly well and truly before that date if it's needed. And I think the, the other thing, though, is that if directors are worried about not being able to go into liquidation, they should really be looking at some asset protection measures at the moment to ensure that, you know, if the worst happens and, uh, and, they, and they don't get the protection of the insolvent trading, that they have looked at what the personal ramifications are now. And as you said earlier, insolvent trading is just one risk that they face. So probably a good idea to look at your personal asset protection situation in any event, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I, I've always believed that that should be there as a primary right from the start. Okay. So the government might change this. They may extend it. They may not. We don't, we don't really know. And as we said a few times, it's only one risk. Let's move on and talk about some of the other recent changes. And there was a, a pretty significant change in responsible lending guidelines. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, Ash? Uh, yeah, well, I guess if you go back in the, the history, the responsible lending came about after the J, J, GFC um, and it was put in place to put a little bit more onus on the banks to ensure that they were only providing loan products to people who could afford those loan products. So for most, most of the people here today, they would have come across clients who have gone to borrow money 
um, the banks would have required them to look into their bank statements. And, you know, there's often jokes, well, not jokes, but serious issues about banks saying no because they've got too many Uber Eats and too many Netflix and uh, looking at deposits into, uh, into betting accounts and things like that. So um, a number of things that the banks would just say, no, you, you're no longer, a, if this isn't the right product for you, you shouldn't have a loan. So to, to help make it easier for banks to lend, which is obviously what the government wants to do, is to get more money into the market, mm. they've relaxed the rules around this responsible lending. And they've probably moved more from a, a, lender, a, a lender responsibility principle back to a borrower uh, responsibility principle. So a borrower... Um, but it has the onus is on the borrower to make sure that they're only borrowing money that they can afford. Uh, and that's the theory of the change, mm-hmm. how that plays out with the banks and you know, their, their own risk profiles is something still to be seen. And some of the conversations I've had so far hasn't shown a lot of change in the banking policies. Mm-hmm. But some of these things take time to come through as well. Does the banks in the current environment... Have we seen that they've been a little bit more risk averse? Would that be a fair comment? Uh, certainly, in some areas, yeah. I think particularly your primaries have um, have changed their risk adverse policies. I think there there is more aggressive in the secondary and um, and and the third tier markets. Yeah. Uh, but even them, they're still you know from what we're hearing, they're still making it a little bit difficult. So they no longer have to go through and really examine or, or do some sort of audit of a client's living expenses to be able to assess that loan. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to start freeing up that, that availability of credit. I, no, I, I think what it does, it gives them some uh, flexibility that they didn't have before when the responsible lending principles are in place. So how they utilise that is, is something uh, still to be determined. Okay. So again, we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, if the, the policy produces the desired, the outcome that the government's looking for, and uh, that'll be up to the lenders and their willingness to lend. So let's move on and talk about the really big one, what I think the big change has been, and that's the Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill of 2020. Can you just give us a high-level overview of what that looks like, Ash? So... When this was announced, the Treasurer called it a uh, similar to or based on the Chapter 11, uh, the US Chapter 11 bankruptcy approach for corporations. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's designed for small businesses, so they've, they've set it up with some eligibility criteria yep. and, uh, and allowed, so it's only for a specific section of the market. But, and what it really, in my mind, is it's created another tool in the toolkit for businesses to potentially utilise. It, it's not going to be the uh, saviour of the world. Mm. So why would they introduce something like this that's largely modelled on Chapter 11 bankruptcy from the states? What's the thinking behind it? Well, the, main, the, the main concept behind it was that small businesses, uh, at the moment in Australia, the, the insolvency system is a one-size-fits-all. So... If you're a fish and chip shop that's in trouble or if you're Virgin, uh, Virgin Australia, you've actually got to use the same system. And, and that's not very cost effective for the, for the small business market. So the, the need to um, provide a small business um, opportunity in the insolvency framework was where this came from, um, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, how it plays out is, the, is obviously a different issue. Um, and, you know, sometimes the cost of running an administration like a Virgin-style voluntary administration and deed of company arrangement actually is so cost prohibitive that a small business can't use it effectively to give them a chance to, to what would otherwise be a good tool for them. So it really stops them from engaging in that with the insolvency industry around voluntary administrations because they just don't have the resources to do it. Is that what's going on? Uh, a lot of the time, yeah. It's it, yeah. It is you know the the ability to do a deal with your creditors and move through that, um, you know, as we've seen at the high end of, of Virgin, is is a good thing that it needs to be made available. But for small business, it just wasn't it wasn't a cost effective tool. Often, 
you would find that the costs were actually higher than the net assets of these small businesses that would otherwise be looking at it. So really, they, they don't have an opportunity to even look at restructuring because they simply can't afford the process. That's correct. Yeah. Now I'm going to throw a number at you now. And so COVID has obviously had a massive impact and could see a wave of liquidations coming. And the government put out some data the other day that said that in 2018, 2019, the number of insolvency appointments was actually down 46% on the year before. Um, so I think the fear there is, Ash, that what's happening with those, those companies that maybe should have gone into liquidation a while ago. Do you have any view on, on what's going to be happening there? Oh, look... I'm not a doom and gloom, uh, Phil, but the, um, there's no doubt there will be a wave of insolvency coming. There are, you know, there's a lot of businesses that are struggling. You know, in Victoria, we only, you know, for a large portion of the market, we only just opened up last week. So, nice. you know, there's a bit of a euphoria around now that we can actually get out and you know, go back into stores. But what that turns into, who knows? So what, what happens from a business point of view? You know, we're, we're predominantly still working from home as well, like a lot of businesses in Victoria. So there, there will be a wave of insolvencies. It's, it's an unfortunate inevitability. And um, the government just really wanted to give some opportunities to make it a little bit easier for businesses that need to go into liquidation to get that done right. Yeah, so good idea. So we've, obviously this is proposed legislation at the moment. It hasn't been passed yet. As you and I have seen many times, there's, there's often last-minute changes. When we think we know what's going on, it gets amended and, and so on. Yeah. But if the legislation passes as it's proposed right now, what will be different? Um, so well, there's two main areas to the legislation that they're looking at. One is this uh, small business restructure, um, uh, uh, restructure uh, plan, and the other is a cheaper liquidation. So... What it'll mean is it's for small businesses, which they're at this stage, they're declaring to be with liabilities of under a million dollars, um, that they they will be able to use this, potentially use this method of, of dealing with their business. So the, the restructure, the small business restructure plan is is very much like a, 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 a well, it is a VA and Docker with a, with a different set of um, clothes on it. Um, it's got the it's got the vest on it, mate, not the tie. <laughs> so, um, Docker, just for our audience, deed of company arrangement proposed under a voluntary administration. Yep. I think my colleague Terry Finn, that you work with in Melbourne, coined it the Aldi Docker, uh, a, bit, a bit cheaper and a bit simpler, which I think is the the best way that I've heard it uh, being expressed. Yep. So, what are the expected benefits out of something like this, Ash? Oh, look, the, the idea is, is that the, this, the, the restructure process is what they're calling a, a, a debtor in control. So the director will remain in control of the business. Because the director is in control of the business, there will be less cost of administrators to actually run the business as we move through. Yeah. Um, it, it's because it's done at a smaller level, there's more of a relationship potentially with some of the creditors in these smaller businesses. Um, but it leaves the director in control um, under some rules. But it, yeah, but effectively, it will be run by the director still um, through the process, which potentially is going to be about twenty, uh, about thirty-five to forty days um, under the current legislation. But what it will do is allow them to put an offer to their creditors in a formal method, um, with with some oversight from an external independent person. Uh, to verify that the, the offer being put up is reasonable. Now, if that offer is rejected, I assume that they could then take advantage of that simplified liquidation process that you referred to earlier. Well, it is a little bit of an interesting one, is that if the offer is rejected, they actually get, um, the, com the company stays with the director and they could actually just go about their business as normal. But if, they, if, if the director thought they were in trouble before, they're still obviously going to be in trouble post a rejection of any offer. And then, yes, potentially you can move into this, this simplified liquidation process. Right. And really behind the idea behind the simplified liquidation process is that, again, sometimes liquidating a company is actually cost prohibitive. Mm. 
Um, they can't get a liquidator to take on the job unless a creditor goes to court to actually wind it up through the court. So a director who wants to take care of the affairs of his business, wants to shut down the business and, and be done with it, again, the, pro- the cost of it was sometimes too high for a de- director to be able to do it. That would leave, and what they don't want to have in the marketplace is all these zombie companies that are just not trading but haven't been liquidated. There's debts out there. So the idea is that a a cheaper, simplified liquidation will allow the insolvency market to clean up some of these companies. Yeah. Now, as you said earlier, eligible companies are those that owe less than a million dollars in total debt. I just thought it was worth stating for our audience that that includes everything. That includes secured debt like bank loans or or leases, all the trade creditors and the ATO. So as you said earlier, another tool in the toolkit, but for companies that have more than a million dollars in debt, well, this just isn't isn't an option for them at all. It does seem... You know, a million doesn't really sound like a lot in the greater scheme of things. Any reason or any rationale behind why they've put these um, eligibility criteria on? Um, well, the the uh, when the government uh, was obviously doing their analysis on this, they had a look at what um, how many well, the level of companies that had gone into liquidation and what the liability levels were. And the stats that they said uh, that were provided as part of the release of this new package was that in 2018-19, 76% of companies that entered into administration had debts of less than a million dollars. So for, in their mind, and, and 98% of those had fewer than, than 20 employees. Right. Uh, was, so they, it was obviously an idea was to catch that smaller end of the market but with the numbers that they're releasing, what they're saying is that it will capture a, a, a large extent of the insolvency market. Um, and given that they, the prediction is such an influx, then they wanted some clean and quick ways to deal with those for the directors. You know, I've got to say, I saw those stats too, and I was a bit surprised because mm-hmm. in my role here as compliance manager at the Young Reed, I review all the strategies or most of the strategies overwhelming majority of strategies that are written around Australia. And the, the idea that 76% have less than a million dollars in debt surprised me because mm. uh, routinely I look at, I would have thought that number was nowhere near uh, 76%. So as you say, it'll probably, we'll need to wait and see how effective it is. And if it does help those smaller companies engage in the process. All right, so debt restructuring process, we've spoken about it a little bit already. Mm. Uh, I've already tagged it with the Aldi docker. Yep. Tell us a little bit more about how it all works, Ash. Um, okay. Well, again, for the audience, let's be clear that we're still waiting for the legislation to get royal assent. So there, there is always the uh, the ability and likelihood that some of these these will ch- these what I'm going to run through will change, but. The, the concept is, as I mentioned before, it's very much like the voluntary administration process. Um, the government, as part of this legislation, have created a new position called a small business restructure practitioner. Um, at the moment, effectively, that's going to be the liquidators and administrators that are currently in the marketplace. Uh, they are talking about there being some others being made available. Uh, but at this stage, we were only aware of administrators and liquidators, and they're well placed to run this sort of model. Mm. The, the idea is that the director will appoint a restructured practitioner, and, and uh, while he continues to run the business, the, the, the restructured practitioner will go through a process of doing some reviews of the business. Yep and help the director um, along with whatever other advisors um, they have to formulate a plan to make an offer. Mm-hmm. During that time, the director has the protection, uh, the full protection of what would, uh, from the administration process. So uh, in general terms, creditors will not be able to take action against the business. They will have to sit and wait for the offer to come through. Mm-hmm. Uh, the director will continue to trade the business, but cannot go about any, can't sell off assets unless it's approved by the restructured practitioner. Um, so he can deal day to day, but he can't do any extra order, extraordinary activities with his assets. Um, 
the the director will then make an offer, uh, which will be uh, an opinion will be provided by the restructured practitioner to the creditors. At the moment, that says it has to be around the 20 day mark, um, but that's again, we're still waiting for exact confirmation. And one of the requirements is before the offer goes up, all employee entitlements must be paid, which is a really big one. It doesn't, that's not required in the voluntary administration process. Um, the director, the director must ensure that all of the employee entitlements are paid in full prior to any offer being made to the creditors. The practitioner will then review the offer and and then um, and then submit a report to the creditors, which is this is all going to be done virtually and online now to reduce the costs again. And the creditors then uh, read that report. Do you think I'll have fifteen I'm days to? Um, I'll have fifteen days to. Um, um, to so I'm just just that offer. Um, about the invoice. Uh, um, we have to upgrade the subscription to be able to do it. Just got, uh, sorry, everyone. I'm just, there's a few people who aren't on mute that I'll uh, just clean up. I'll, uh, there we go. Um, so the, uh, the, the interesting part with this one, though, is that under a voluntary administration, the administrator had to provide an opinion as to whether this was better than liquidation. That's not required in this case. Um, Phil, you've muted yourself, mate. Can't have a conversation with you if you're muted. <laughs> Some people might think that's a good idea, Ash. Yeah, I, yeah, I know my wife would like to see me muted more often. Um, but the, yeah, so, so the, the small business uh, practitioner doesn't have to uh, make an opinion as to whether it's better than liquidation we believe he has to make an opinion as to whether it's affordable. Um, so there'll be a lot of work that needs to be done around getting that confidence with the practitioner. Uh, it's similar to what we saw before. It's a voting on the dollars. So 50% uh, value uh, will determine whether it's, it's successful or not. Mm -hmm. so that's the two second version of what this is going to look like, Phil. I might just jump back a bit. The director appoints the small business restructuring practitioner. Has a creditor got any any ability to do that at all? No, no. no. This is a director led um, uh, operation only. Right. So the director then trades the business in the normal course. Yep. He can sell stock to clients or whatever, but but can't sell major assets. Hmm. What about the small well, business restructuring he, practitioner? He can sell, but only with permission. With permission. Yep. Now, the, the small business restructuring practitioner, they could sell those assets if they felt it was That's, in the best they, interest They of can creditors. notify that the sale can go ahead, but the right. practitioner is not actually uh, in control so that they can't. So they ratify the sale, but it's not That's, up to them to sell. Mm. Okay, great. So um, I think we said earlier that related parties cannot vote on a debt restructure proposal. And that's quite different to the voluntary administration model as it exists today. Yep. What sort of implications do you think that could have? Oh, look, the, the, the no related parties was put in to help uh, uh, protect the integrity of it. And, and yeah, there's a lot of belief that uh, a lot of these dockers, particularly in the small business market, are actually controlled by related parties. Yeah. So they wanted... They wanted to, for the for the total marketplace, give some confidence that you know if these deals were being done, that they were being done by unrelated people voting it up. So it, it's there more as a protection against the unscrupulous users of some of these uh, of these these opportunities. So it it does mean, however, that we're completely in the hands of unrelated people uh, and unrelated creditors and. Uh, you know, we, we don't know at this stage how everyone's going to react to this type of thing. Yeah. Probably makes the recommendation of the small business restructuring practitioner even more important. Uh, and, the and ATO... The, not to... I'll just... Uh, the, and therefore, it's really important that the director has the right advisors sitting beside him to help put together that plan. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So it'll be up to trade creditors and, and statutory obligations like the ATO and so on. 
mm. and they'd be the ones that didn't need to accept that offer. Yep. And at this time, we, we don't really know what their appetite for that might be, do we? No, well, and, you know, if you look at ATO, as the ATO will often tell you, are the, uh, the largest creditor in most liquidations and administrations. And, uh, you know, their, their desire to want to support these is unknown at this stage, what their level, what their requirement, you know, um, they may not support at 20%, but they might support at 70%. We, we don't know where they sit yet. Um, yeah. You know, it's, and quite often you don't ever get to know. Um, until you actually get to the day of the vote. But that's that's something that in itself is going to be interesting, what sort of mandate they decide to uh, put on their staff to vote for it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mm. Now, I believe there's been some changes to the position with, un, with secured creditors. And without going into too much detail and noting that it's all subject to amendment, what, are, what sort of changes are there for, in terms of secure creditors acting on their security interest? Uh, well, it is reasonably similar to the administration in that they can't particularly move once the appointment's in place. So if, if they had taken possession of an asset prior to uh, the director appointing, um, the the director, uh, sorry, the, the they can hold the asset, but they won't have an ability to sell during the period. Um, if they haven't taken possession, then it doesn't look like they're going to have the ability to take possession in the general rules um, through the through the process as well. Uh, so it, it's their rights haven't changed significantly, uh, but what it does mean is that they will have to sit on their hands a little bit um, and look at how the process works. Mm. Doesn't mean that their security is invalid. It just means that they've got to sit on their hands for a bit longer. And if you little quirks about if it's perishable goods, they might be able to come in and take them under their security instrument. And uh, if it's substantially the whole of the company's property, they may be able to, to take it. But uh, probably a few more restrictions or quirks on, on what we have at the moment. Yeah. So that's a bit about debt restructuring, um, the debt restructuring process and making an offer to creditors, unrelated, it's not being able to vote and it really being up to unrelated parties to either accept or reject that offer. Yep. So that's a bit about that. Let's talk a little bit now about the simplified liquidation process, Ash. Yep. What insights do you have on that for us? Um, look, again, it's a great tool that, um, that will be useful in certain cases. So to, to ensure that so the government could actually give the liquidators the ability to do a simplified process, um, they've, they've taken away some of the obligations of the liquidators from the terms of reporting. Uh, they've taken away some of the uh, ability for them to continue to chase uh, preferential and uncommercial transactions. Mm. So they've, they've said that that's not going to happen. One of the issues, um, it, it can only be a direct, uh, uh, appointed by a director under a simple liquidation. The courts won't have the ability to do that. Right. But there are there are provisions for creditors and the court to turn it into a full liquidation. So even though a director may appoint a, 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 a simplified liquidation process in play, there is an ability for it to convert into a full liquidation by the creditors uh, or the courts as necessary. Okay. It's still under the one million limit. Uh, so again, it can only be provide uh, uh, is only going to be available to uh, companies that have less than a million dollars worth of debt. And yeah. if it's determined after appointment that it is above the million, then it will be a requirement to uh, convert it into the uh, full liquidation. Okay, so we keep hearing simplified liquidation process, lower cost. Do we know how much lower? No, not at this point. <laughs> of course not. Uh, and, and rightfully so, the, yeah, we, the liquidators are still waiting uh, to, to see the detail. So therefore, their ability to be able to cost this up is, uh, is very difficult when they don't actually know in detail what they're going to have to do yet. So uh, that's something still to wait and see. Probably won't have an idea on, on the, the savings from, a, from a, that point of view probably till early December. 
but realistic to assume that if there's fewer investigations that they need to do, they're, they're not going to be pursuing certain claims the way that they do now. Easier reporting system and electronic meetings. Well, hopefully there is a bit of cost being taken out of it on the liquidator's side. Yep. So I hope, you know, it's reasonable to assume that there could be some saving there for people that are looking to engage in that process. Without a doubt, yeah. So lots of rules, lots of details still to come out, limited to company debts under a million, as we've said a few times. And as you say, another tool, but not a solution for every client every time. No. I, I think one, you know, I guess if there's one thing that I would like to say is that, you know, all of these things need to be looked at, um, need to be looked at as part of what is the best opportunity. So, you know, as you know, Phil, when we have a look at a client, we're not actually making a decision that this is a, um, a, a VA or this is a liquidation or this is a restructure yeah. without looking at all the facts. So for us, it's very exciting that both of these have been brought into the mix as another tool that could be used to help um, protect the director or to, uh, protect the business and give it the best opportunity to move forward if that's what it's needed. Hmm. Uh, but it is nothing more than just another tool. Uh, you know, and, and if it is the right if it is the right fit for a particular uh, one, then that'll be what we recommend. If it's not the best fit, then it won't be what we recommend. Hmm. So there's a few things that it won't do, though, isn't there, Ash? So talk us through a few of the things that directors of companies need to think about that aside from this, that's going to happen whether this model's in place or not. Well, look, uh, one thing to say is that this is still only a corporate uh, component. So we're not actually talking about the impacts on the personal end of it. So whether you use the restructure, simplified liquidation or any of those, these are corporate only. They don't look at the impacts personally. Mm. So you, you, if, if you do do a restructure through this simplified process and you get a deal at 30 cents in the dollar, it doesn't mean that the creditors can't chase the director for the rest under their personal guarantee. Right. Um, so the, the flow on to the director individually um, is still something that's very valid. Uh, and, you know, secured creditors will still want to be paid. Uh, you know, if you have personal guarantees, they may still be pursued. Mm. Um, they can, and it's not like you can use this all the time. There, there are limits to the, the how often a director can use these methods to try and protect themselves as well. But there, there's still, for us, you've got to look at the personal side of the, uh, the flow through on these as well. You know, I think just in my experience here at the Young Reed, that's absolutely critical is to look at it from a holistic point of view, to look at both the corporate and the personal. And one thing it, that I know in my work here is the first thing I want to know is what does my client want? What do they want to achieve? What outcome are they looking for? So for me, it's never about a cookie cutter approach because one size doesn't fit all. And this certainly isn't going to fit everybody, but it could be a really positive thing in those cases where it does. It, it may give those smaller businesses an opportunity to engage in a, a debt restructure process that they, they currently don't have right now. Yes. Yeah. All right. And, and look, the, the other thing uh, that, that we haven't spoken about as part of this relief package is that we talked at the start about how the insolvent trading protection runs off on the 31st of December. Mm. Um, there, there is, they have put into this package, and again, still waiting for specifically what that's going to, how this is going to play out. But if a company wants to extend their protection under this, um, the, they have said that there will be an ability for a director to notify that they are intending to use this process somewhere in the next three months, so right. in, the, in that January to March period. Um, we don't know what that form looks like yet because it actually hasn't been created, um, but apparently it will be a form that will be a notification that will go up on uh, uh, ASIC's website in some form. Uh, so, if we, if you have a, a client that you, is uh, is concerned and may need to look at these things, uh, then now's the time that we've got to sit down with them, work out whether this is the process that we're going to use, 
And if it is, whether nominating is something that we need to do before the 31st of December to, to ensure that that protection is extended. All right. Well, thank you, Ash. That's all the questions I had for you, mate. You've done well again. We, uh, we're, we're keeping it nice and quick and simple. So I will open up. If anyone has any questions, um, you can put up your hand, I think, on the system or you can uh, type them into the chat box and we can talk about any of your thoughts uh, or comments or questions that you may have in relation to these new areas. Um, I think while we're waiting for people to formulate that, what I, I will say is that, um, you know, and I, I think Phil and I have made it relatively clear that it, it is potentially a very good tool, but it is only that. It's still something that um, identifying those who need it and getting that independent um, holistic advice is still very much a critical thing uh, and still imperative to actually ensure that we get the right results for everyone. Um, uh, there's no questions have popped up yet, but please feel free just to unmute yourself and, and ask away if you do. Uh, there are a lot of very smart minds on here that may also have some comments that they want to raise. Give everyone a second. Well, okay. Well, we've either done a very good job, Phil, or we've done a very bad job. It's uh, somewhere in the middle there. I know what I'm telling my boss it was, Ash. We'll, we'll, we'll say we did it well. Uh, so I will wrap up then if there are no questions and no thought uh, or, or no comments that people wish to raise. Uh, I will let you know that the um, uh, that our next month's uh, webinar, which will have the invites going out shortly, and, and it is open to registration now is that we've been, uh, we're blessed to have Martin Lacos from Macquarie Bank uh, coming to have a chat to us. Uh, that will be on the 10th of December. And uh, the, and he's going to obviously talk, uh, he's a phenomenal um, economist who most of you would have seen on, t on TVs uh, around the place and probably heard him speak, a fantastic speaker, passionate about economics. And he's going to give us a bit of a rundown on his thoughts on the world economy and then how that flows back into Australia. And, and no doubt he'll cover off on the impacts of the Reserve Bank going down to 0.1% and starting to buy bonds for the next three to five years and um, how that actually plays out. So in my little economist mind, I don't quite understand a lot of that detail, but we're, uh, we are very uh, lucky that we've got him coming along. So look out for that invite. Uh, it will be very enjoyable. Uh, it, for, for Phil and I, it will, it's the last of the Phil and Ashley show for this year, uh, but you're more than welcome to come back and uh, have a chat to us uh, or give us a call if you have any other questions. Absolutely. Um, so on that note, if there's nothing else, thank you for the thank you comments yeah. coming through the box. Um, and uh, all of you, I wish you all the best. If you're having a bet on today in the, uh, in the Oaks Day, uh, I hope you have some success there. And if not, uh, from me personally, if I don't get to talk to you, I hope that you have a wonderful end of this year. And I look forward to a very exciting uh, and, uh, and uh, successful Thank you very much. Thank you.